Well, thank you all for braving 128 or the back streets of Waltham and Belmont and places like that on a rainy uh, rush hour. I'm reminded of a talk I gave, I was invited to give a talk in uh, electrical engineering at Berkeley about five years ago. And I asked, when do you want me to give the talk? And they said, oh, five o'clock on Friday. And I said, who's going to be there at five o'clock on Friday? So I said, don't worry, come at five o'clock on Friday. So I came and they ushered me into the front of the auditorium and the room was packed. I thought, well, this is pretty amazing. All these people are coming here to see my talk. And then they wheeled a keg of beer down the aisle. <laughs> okay, I'm the entertainment and that's why they're here. Um, so I hope you enjoy the pizza and while you're eating it, I'll give a talk. Uh, so I'm from the MIT Media Lab in Kendall Square, not too far from here. I am also involved in a new company uh, in New York and London called The Modern Mirror. We do immersive experiences for the luxury fashion industry. And we might be hiring pretty soon if you are people who are interested in creating very, very rich immersive user experiences. And I have to thank uh, my students and my outside collaborators and the people who pay for us to do this work. So what exactly does my research group do? Well, we're, you know, lots of people seem to think that the future is going to involve having this intermediary between us and our experiences. You know, you're going to be looking at a mobile device, you're going to be wearing something, and you're going to be experiencing the world through that. And what we would like to do in my research group, and we have a collection of people who range from uh, you know, cognitive scientists to engineers to computer scientists to someone who majored in comparative religion, like somebody who did visual effects in Hollywood for 15 years before deciding he really wanted a master's degree. But what we're all trying to do is we're trying to take what people find engaging about the virtual world and about apps and try to make the physical world that connected and that context aware and that responsive. And ideally, we want to do this in ways where we have minimally visible technology. Even if it's incredibly sophisticated technology, the technology is not the thing you see. And also a whole lot of fun if you do that. So we're really trying to make the physical world more engaging. And I have a collection of projects that I'm going to be talking about here that were done in our research group. Not all of these do everything it says here. Uh, so I'm going to talk, first talk a little bit about some work we've done over the past several years with NHK, the Japanese television network. They've had uh, both technical people and content people embedded in my group for some years. And we've been thinking about 8K television. And I don't know how many of you know. Have, it, have any of you seen 8K TV? Uh, so think four times 4K or 16 times HD. Uh, and you know, it, when people look at that and they say, well, that's this really frightening amount of data. The fact is you can build a PC at Newegg that'll happily drive an 8K TV, high dynamic range, run Unity. Uh, Windows is almost unusable because the type is so small you can't find anything and it takes forever to get the mouse from one of the screen to the other. So we had to put a touch screen on it. Uh, but we were, you know, NHK is going to broadcast the next Olympics in 8K. And we were interested in seeing what you could do with a very, very large, say, bigger than 90 inch 8K screen um, and enough computation behind it to do some interesting stuff. So uh, the first experiment we did is NHK has this enormous television archive. It goes back to the early 1950s. And they thought it would be really fun to give people the ability to access the archive. But it's so much information, you don't really want a YouTube style interface. And so we were looking to make an interface that could be used by kids, could be used by the elderly. And we thought of the metaphor of a time machine, which is to say that you could relive some age, it was, you know, when the TV was really good, not like the junk now. And you could look at everything that was on television when you were 11, you know, when you were into cartoons or something like that. So we have 60 years of source material available. And in order to prove that 8K isn't scary, we decided to do this whole thing as a browser application uh, rather than write a whole lot of external code. So the sequence of screens is you select the year you were born, you select the age you want to relive, and then it brings up everything that was on television that year because 8K is a lot of real estate. Uh, and so you then get a period appropriate TV and a little animated companion who watches the program with you. So it looks like this. And when you're ready.
And you get the jukebox from that year. <clears throat> Takes a little while to fetch the data. And that little guy called Telly actually responds to what's on the screen, uh, what's on the program. So this was more about just thinking about how do you give people access to an enormous amount of information in a very efficient and intuitive <coughs> way where you don't have to type anything and where you can quickly get to what you're looking for in a huge corpus of audio and video. A very different problem, and this was one that was generated locally in our lab. So we have a group headed by Ed Boyden uh, who are trying to explore the brain. And they're trying to image the brain at very, very high resolution such that you can actually see individual neurons. And when you do that, you end up with scary amounts of data. So there is a process that was developed that actually makes neurons fluoresce in different colors. And there's a process called expansion microscopy, which actually can take a piece of tissue and make it bigger so that you can image stuff that's too small to image with a light microscope with a light field microscope. And so they take sections of brain and they expand them so that it's actually possible to image stuff that's smaller than a wavelength of light using a light microscope, which is pretty amazing. And so uh, talking about how much data, um, if you take a little cube of a mouse brain, in the hippocampus in this case, and it's 1.2 millimeters by 0.6 by 0.2 millimeters, so not a lot of brain, and you make a volumetric image of it, that's five terabytes right there. Uh, so the whole mouse brain is hundreds of terabytes, and your brain is a whole lot more than that. Um, so the display resolution is actually 50 nanometers per pixel or per voxel in the most zoomed in state. So that's uh, you know one tenth the wavelength of green light, and we're able to image optically. So the question you have to ask is, how do you even begin to navigate through a monstrosity like that? And so the answer is, <clears throat> I mean, this is what a, just one surface looks like, but you're actually dealing with a volume. And to give you an idea of the imaging difference, so this is what a neuron looks like in HD, this is what it looks like in 4K, and this is what it looks like in 8K, and the anatomists really like the 8K version, of course. We had to, in particular, the people from Toshiba who did this work, had to come up with an interesting data partitioning algorithm so that we could get rapid access and rendering to this five terabytes in real time. Because you've got a touch screen, and you're zooming around in a five terabyte sea of data, and you don't want any delays. And we're doing this all in a PC. So it looks like this. And we're rolling. So that's that whole slice. That's the five terabytes. Uh, that you're looking at there, and then you can zoom in. And ultimately, this is intended to be a collaborative application, so multiple people are supposed to be uh, navigating through this data set, <clears throat> making annotations and tagging things so that other people can see them. So this is meant to be a tool for researchers in uh, neurology. So when we had this big 8K screen set up at the entrance to my lab space, one of the things that we found is that whenever somebody was using the screen, a couple of other people would come and lean over that person's shoulder and offer usually not helpful advice on the right way to do things. So we decided to turn that bug into a feature. And we said, if we have that much screen real estate and this thing is so engaging, why don't we make collaborative games for that big screen? And so. Uh, we used a Kinect originally. We've actually now moved to an Intel RealSense camera, and we're migrating the code over to the RealSense. It's a lot smaller, and it's a little better behaved. Uh, so the first one it's actually arose from a joke. We, one of the grad students, Pedro, works odd hours. And so inevitably, at some point during the day, somebody would ask, where's Pedro? And so we made a version of Where's Waldo called Where's Pedro, 
where it's a social game and we have a procedurally generated very dense cityscape and Pedro's in there somewhere and you have to work with your team to find him. And so this looks as follows. And so here you're using, you can use gesture or touch uh, to navigate. And so what has to happen is that the members of the team actually have to have side conversations about the strategy they're going to use uh, to look for Pedro. And you can get a sense of just how complex this game is when you start zooming in. And I'll skip to the punchline where they find him. There he is. And that's Pedro finding himself. So that's not fair. <laughs> uh, so this one was intended to be a game for children. Again, a collaborative game that multiple children have to play in the same space. And so we have a, the Unity game engine running in 8K high dynamic range. And we have a jungle. And the jungle has nocturnal creatures. And you're trying to find all of them. And you know, in our more enlightened age, you can't use a gun. You use a flashlight. And when you light up the creature, you know, the system registers it. Well, the problem is it's a big jungle, and you have this wimpy little two AA battery flashlight in your hand. So you can't explore the whole jungle. So you have to do it with some friends. And you have to figure out a strategy to cover the space. And, uh, and in fact, we don't even give you the flashlight. The Kinect turns your palm into the flashlight. So you just move the, the palm of your hand around, and you see a beam come up on the screen. And that looks like this. It was for kids, but grad students really love it. <laughs> and sometimes the frogs crawl up the inside of the monitor. <laughs> So that's actually been installed in a number of locations in Japan for educational reasons. Uh, one of the current students in the group, Vic Parthaban, is concerned with how do you do gestural interfaces for a really big screen, and in particular, a really big screen that's potentially at a distance. And so imagine you have a wall-sized screen, and it's the other end of the room. How can you navigate with it? So he's made a system called Large User Interface that just uses a, a leap motion on the table in front of you, but it allows you uh, to interact with a large number of items on a screen at a distance just using your fingers. And the visual language is really simple. You can learn it in about 15 seconds. And the trick here is it's actually showing you the positions of your fingers. And the filled in finger is your index finger. And that's the selector. And so there are a set of gestures. And so the system is giving you immediate feedback. And people really love this. This does work, by the way, if you want to take something like a magic leap and not use the controller you can do pretty much anything you do with a VR or AR controller with your fingers using this interface as well. Um, and this is being made available through a browser so that you can kind of paste this onto anything else. But here you see somebody going through a picture library elsewhere. They're selecting a movie, and they're doing a number of other things. Uh, and it, this is not sped up. This really is that efficient. And that screen is about. 30 feet away from him that he's doing this with. So sometimes we resort to projection mapping, which is to say we have a physical object, and we have one or more projectors, and we have calibration software that knows the shape of the physical surface that we're projecting onto, because we've found that the psychological effect of having a 3D object that has the content directly projected on it is very powerful in some settings. In this case, uh, this was something that, was, that we did for uh, the MIT Museum and also for the New England Aquarium in downtown Boston. And it's intended to teach about bleaching of coral reefs. And so 
the data set here is literally a coral reef in the Pacific was scanned using LIDAR, and then we took the point cloud data from that, and we used an NC milling machine to mill a big piece of styrofoam to be a replica of the reef, and then we have imagery that was shot there that gets projected onto the model, and when you walk up to it, you know, it reacts to you, and the water warms up, you know, if you're moving around and stuff happens, and it explains to you what's going on. So this was a, an installation that was in a museum for a while. We're doing a lot more with projection mapping. It's very easy now. When we first did projection mapping, you kind of had to solve all the math problems yourselves, but nowadays there are a lot of really good libraries out there that make things like this pretty easy to do, and it's more a matter of just having sufficiently good data sets. So a friend of mine from Harvard and I got a grant, actually we got two grants, I got one and he got another one, uh, to try to make a movie using a volumetric display. So a volumetric display is a unique kind of 3D display because it doesn't fool your eye, it literally puts the pixels in space. And so if any of you has one of those stupid USB fans with LEDs on it that you know, says I love you when you plug it into your USB port, that's actually about the simplest case of a volumetric display. It's also the least interesting. But what, it, what it's doing is it's demonstrating that you literally have the pixels lit up at points in space. And there are more complex things that have 3D spaces that LEDs rotate through. Uh, this, tech, this particular technology comes from a company in Australia called Voxon, and it's a high-speed DLP projector with an oscillating translucent projection screen that moves up and down. And so it paints the voxel slices on the whole stack in a 30th of a second. And it's grainy and it sounds really loud when it's running and there's just something really charmingly retro about how clunky the technology is. So we're embracing that. And so we have a, we did a workshop with MIT, Harvard and Wellesley students over January. A bunch of them decided to stay around through the spring and the summer. And so we have a screenplay and we're actually doing production. We're doing pre-production planning right now. We'll be doing production shortly on what will be a 20 minute film for this display. And there are a whole lot of interesting things that come up because this is a unique sort of 3D display. All the content has to fit in a box. You know, you don't have a horizon infinitely far out. It's all happening right there. Lots of cinematic language, lots of transitions and, and sense of, you know, the camera has moved from here to there doesn't work right for most audiences on a display like this. So we have to create a new visual language. We have to think about interaction means you know, does the content know that there are people in the room and where they're standing? Well, we can do that because we've put real sense cameras on there so they know if you walk into the room where you are and if you're looking at it or not. So we can have the content know that and respond to it if the artist wants. Uh, but this is an ongoing project, so stay tuned. We also decided to make the world's cheapest display that looks about the same. And this is a pseudo volumetric display, which means it looks exactly like a volumetric display. It's 3D, but it has no moving parts. What it is, is it's a 4K monitor lying on its back with either a par radial parallax barrier, if you know what that is, or a radial lenticular array and a mylar cone. Or in some cases, a really big margarita glass with the stem cut off. That works really nicely too. And so, each eye sees a different, stereo, different image from a stereo pair and you can move your head around 360 degrees and you see 360 degrees stereo on this thing, but the display itself costs pretty much nothing. Uh, now, one of the students, Emily, who's an amazing programmer, had to write a Unity shader that renders all those views on this thing in real time, which was a bit of a tour de force. Uh, but we, now that we have this, we're creating immersive, personalized, and potentially scalable digital experiences for this display. Because the problem with volumetric displays is that because you've got moving parts, it's hard to make them big. So there are lots of volumetric displays that are about the size of a toaster, and there are almost none that are the size of a telephone booth. And we'd like to be able to make displays that are like that, that are arbitrarily large. And this particular thing, which we call pseudo-volumetric, it scales as big as you want. So we're, we're continuing to experiment with that. And of course you have to do Princess Leia, right? So we did Princess Leia. Uh, 
So you probably know what a Pepper's ghost is. Some of you have probably heard it called a hologram. Don't call it a hologram. It's not a hologram. It's not diffractive, and it's not even 3D. It's a half-silvered mirror with a projector. And the object appears to be behind it. And you know, Pepper died about 150 years ago, and it was old when he did it. Uh, there's a 15th century Italian magician who wrote a textbook on magic describing it as a really old trick that the Arabic magicians used to do a million years ago. So when somebody comes to you and says, we have this hologram technology, we're going to bring dead rock stars to life, uh, I tell them, well, you're about a thousand years too late. Um, but we decided, you know, the effect is interesting. Can we do something that's a bit more uh, sophisticated than that? So we developed a retroreflective aerial display. And so it's like a Pepper's ghost with two significant differences. And one of the differences is it's not just a single projector, it's a projector array. And so as you move your head around you, or you walk around, you get motion parallax. Your eyes are seeing different stereo pairs the whole way across. And the second thing is there's a retroreflective sheet on the inside with the result that the light field reconstructs on the outside of it. So it's not behind the beam splitter, it's out in front of everything, which is important if you want to do a gestural interface. You want to be able to reach in and move something, because you can't reach into a Pepper's ghost. There's this thing in the way. Or if you want to do a free space haptic feedback so that when you push on the object, you can feel it's there, you need the haptic field to be coincident with the light field, and your hand has to be able to reach in there. So this is, this was a really trivial early version. I'm sorry for the low quality of this video. For some reason, when I play it more than once, PowerPoint chokes. But, um, but it was, I mean, it was a brain on a table. Uh, and then we did a full size Princess Leia, and it's miserable trying to photograph these things. So my apologies for that. Uh, there's the brain. And it really just does hang out over the table. It's quite eerie. So uh, one of my students, Laura, one of the PhD students who's interested in getting people to care about the environment, and in particular about water quality, uh, has been looking to make very, very large scale data visualization experiences. And so her thought was, let's imagine we collect data on the pH of the water in the Charles River or uh, where the plumes of hydrocarbon leaks are from the tank farms on the coast of Chelsea or something like that. Collect it, you'd normally make a spreadsheet, you'd make a PDF of the spreadsheet, you'd post it on the web somewhere, and nobody would look at it. And you really want the people in the immediate area to understand the problem in a deep personal way and to uh, take action about it. And so what she did is she created a fleet of boats, RC boats, and the boats have a whole bunch of sensors in them for pH and conductivity and turbidity and hydrocarbons and uh, other things. And she has a group of very dedicated middle school students who go out at night and they send these boats out onto the water and they do long exposure stills or videos and as the boats crisscross, the colors change corresponding to what the boats are sensing. And so it is both a really beautiful image that you get out of it, but also uh, it's an experience that the children are driving these boats, so they get a lesson in it. But it's also an experience for the community, because people just come down and watch this happen. You know, and you can see it from your apartment. You can see it if you're coming into Logan, and you look down at the right point in time. And so we've had these big events over the past couple of springs, summers, and autumns. We have another set of them coming up this summer. Interesting takeaway from this. So uh, Laura staged a bunch of these, and they were very popular. And some of the attendees said, well, could we use this without the sensors? And she said, what do you mean? And they said, well, we want to paint on the river. And so she said, OK. And I don't have an example of that here, but it literally, if we do one, OK, here it is. Uh, so literally, she gave them the ability to change the color of the boats while the boats are going across the water.
So you can see some of the images here behind the credits. Edwina, one of uh, a student who finished her PhD last year, was interested in thinking about how do we rethink the notion of connectivity, and particularly urban connectivity. So there is a category of city planner who believes if we just put in enough wireless broadband, everything will be good. Uh, you know, and no, what happens is when you put in more wireless broadband, people start sending 4K cat pictures to the same people they were sending <laughs> HD cat pictures to. They aren't communicating with the people at different socioeconomic levels. So it doesn't solve anything. So Edwina, who grew up in Mexico City, you know, and is very concerned about the fact that Mexico City is a city where you will have two neighborhoods at exact opposite ends of the socioeconomic spectrum that are divided by one street. And the people just don't ever cross from one side of that street to the other. They go to the playground and the library and everything else on their side. Uh, so she wanted to take you know, the large amount of wireless data capacity that's being put in and repackage it in different ways that would encourage people to communicate. And so she interviewed a whole lot of people throughout the city at different uh, you know, at different levels of society and ask them what are the iconic things about the city? You know, what are the, the features of the city that make it really special? And she found the things that people agreed on uh, were these urban forests, so these parks that have lots of trees in them, playgrounds, and the vendor tricycles to go from one neighborhood to another, you know, the knife sharpeners and other things like that. So she said, how do I layer connectivity on each one of those in a way that will make people communicate with others than they normally would communicate with? So one of the examples was these connected bits of playground equipment. And so this playground equipment is built out of scaffolding. And the material that supports the kids climbing or bouncing on it is both stretch sensitive and electroluminescent. And so when a child is climbing or jumping up and down, it's sensing where the hands and feet are. And there's a corresponding piece of playground equipment in another playground that lights up with that pattern. And you don't have to explain that to a three-year-old. It just makes sense. The three-year-old says, oh, I'm going to go play with that kid. And, and, you know, and you get this feedback, and there's information in each place explaining about the neighborhood where the person you're playing with is from and what it's like there. Uh, and so that's been, that's been extremely successful. And again, you know, we have lots of video of adults bouncing up and down on these things at night because they're so cool because they glow. Uh, the next thing was a project that was done in collaboration with Joe Paradiso's group at the Media Lab called Listen Tree, where we have these little, and I'm sorry, I forgot to bring one, but it's a little solar powered transducer. It looks kind of like a small hockey puck with a screw in it. You screw it into the roots of a tree, it doesn't hurt the tree but it turns the entire tree into a speaker. So the whole tree vibrates and makes sound. So then what they'll do is they'll stage an event in multiple neighborhoods where the trees are having the same concert, or in one case, there was a set of famous Mexican poets and each poet was reading a, you know, his or her favorite poem and each tree was a poet. And Mexicans being the uh, expressive people they are, we have enormous numbers of photos and videos of people hugging trees because they really like what the tree has to say. But the notion there was you go to your park and there's something happening there that's happening in everybody else's park. So you have this experience in common <coughs> with everybody else you work with or everybody else you know. Uh, and then the third one was the vendor tricycle. And without going into a lot of detail, the vendor tricycles go around. And, we, and they now have the ability to record where they are, what the neighborhood looks like, you know, what kinds of interactions the people had with the vendor on the trike. And so when it comes to your town square, you can see where it's been. And, you, and what you do with that vendor will then be seen by the next group of people. And again, so each one of these is a different way of taking connectivity, uh, you know, physical connectivity or connectivity in terms of wiring up trees or connectivity in terms of wiring up playgrounds uh, and making it physical. So some other work that we're doing, uh, this is work that's being done by Everett Lawson. And this is about 
and I'm, I can't go into a lot of detail because it's complicated, but your peripheral vision affects what you see in your central vision. And so it is possible to, let's say, put something in your peripheral vision that makes you think your car is going faster or slower than it actually is. Uh, you can have the car go at a constant speed, but you'll be convinced it's speeding up or slowing down. Um, you can put other kinds of information out there that overrides what all your other senses are telling you. And so we're looking at the user interface uh, applications of that sort of thing. Uh, last couple of years, one of the students in the group, Ali, has gotten really excited about pneumatics. And so we've presented this at CHI. A, a, a couple of years, we've presented air-based things at CHI. Uh, so this was last year's paper where he, this was originally designed for people with limited mobility to allow them to pick things up. So it's these rings, when you put your hand down on the table, if you put your hand over something, they detect it's there, they inflate appropriately, and you can pick it up. Uh, but people have found that this is useful even if you are regularly abled, you can manipulate the world in some interesting ways. This other thing, which I unfortunately don't have a video of, this is air vortex free space haptics. So we track your hand using a leap motion or something similar. When you are about to touch an object in this 3D display field, you actually feel the surface of the object because an air vortex flies across and hits your fingers from the normal direction of the surface you're touching. Uh, this is a, now unlike, if any of you has used the ultra haptics, ultrasonic system, this has a couple of significant differences. One, it's a whole lot cheaper. Two, uh, unlike the ultrasonic haptics, this comes in from the side rather than underneath, so it can be coincident with a 3D light field, whereas with ultra haptics, it has to be, it's generally somewhere else. Your hand is somewhere and the display is somewhere else. And the third difference is that it's a lot more powerful. Air vortex haptics works out to a distance of meters and the US military actually did some experiments on using air vortex guns instead of rubber built bullets for crowd control. So it's a plenty strong stimulus if you crank up the power. It'll knock you off your feet, literally. Uh, so we're experimenting with that um, because one of the things we find, if you've got a collection of 3D objects in space, like that brain, if you put your hand in there to push it around, the instant it doesn't move, I mean, the instant it starts moving but you don't feel anything pushing back, it destroys the illusion of 3D. And the haptics doesn't even have to be very good, provided the timing is right and the effect is good. Your brain does a fabulous job of integrating all of the stimuli together to make you think it's all unified because your brain wants it to make physical sense. And so uh, we have a really annoying demo that just blows soap bubbles in Unity and you can break them with your fingers and people can't stop and it drives us crazy because you can hear them pop. And so I'm sitting in my office and all day, it's like, <laughs> hey, look at this. <laughs> and so some, you know, I keep moving it farther from my door, but I can still hear it. Uh, so I said, a pepper's ghost isn't a hologram. A real hologram is a diffractive device, it uses diffraction of light, which means you need really tiny pixels, like the size of the wavelength of light, uh, to create a 3D light field. And if you could have a material that does that and you could change it at, say, 30 times a second, you could make a true moving hologram. So what you want, essentially, is something like a piece of glass where you couple in light from the edge and it could make a light field in front of it or behind it or if you wore it as a visor, it could make something out in front of you. So we have a particular technology, again, you can read about this on our website, for doing this, but the punchline is it's surface acoustic waves. The hologram is just acoustic ripples on the surface of a piece of transparent material and they cause the light that's traveling in a waveguide just under the surface to be diffracted and outcoupled toward your eye and make a hologram. And so that's pretty cool, but what's cooler is we're making these chips not in a standard chip fab, but one of the PhD students for his doctoral dissertation made a femtosecond laser printer that prints the chips. So it's a desktop printer, doesn't need a clean room, doesn't need chemicals, and we can make the waveguides, the gratings, and we can even deposit metal. And you can see it here writing a grating in real time. And MIT students, being MIT students, 
as soon as they figured out they could do this to glass and quartz and lithium niobate, they went in in the middle of the night and put Jolly Ranchers in there. And so we have the most beautiful diffractive candy. It has brag volume gratings in it. Um, and they also did chocolate. The chocolate one is interesting because if you make the gratings in the surface of the chocolate and the chocolate has been stored outside of the comfortable range for temperature or humidity for chocolate, the grating goes away. And so you can use it kind of like as a quality seal on the chocolate bar. Uh, so this technology does make holograms. Um, the see-through stuff is still a work in progress. We made an earlier non-see-through version of it, which we made a desktop monitor that was about the size and shape of the original Mac, for those of you who remember that, and made an image about the size of the original Mac and 3D full color hologram. Uh, the images have 360,000 pixels per scan line to make an image that big. So that's a lot of pixels. Uh, but we were able to compute it with a single PC with four GPUs in it by some very, very intense GPU programming. So although it's a lot of data and a lot of computation, it's not orders of magnitude away from what you can just order from Newegg, which is kind of neat. But ultimately, maybe we don't need displays at all. And so the thing I want to talk about at the end is, the, is an idea almost as old as the Pepper's Ghost, or whatever they called it you know, back in the Middle Ages. So it's been known for a really long time by some people, but not by most people, that you don't need a display in order to cause people to see things. So it was discovered at least as far back as 1755 that you know, your, visual, your visual cortex is at the back of your skull. And if you have an electromagnetic discharge somewhere in the vicinity of your visual cortex you know, on the outside of your head, so it's non-invasive, it will cause a current to be induced in your visual cortex. And you'll see what's called a phosphine. It's a bright spot. It's like when you poke your finger in your eye and you see a bright spot, except that's a mechanically induced phosphine and this is an electrically induced phosphine. And so there are all these wonderful kind of steampunky images I found of, you know, if you're an electrical engineer, you might actually have heard of some of these people. Uh, you know, sticking their heads in big coils 120 years ago um, because it was apparently the thing to do, you know. Uh, you know nowadays, you know, we can just go to a store and buy, buy candies, but uh, at, the, at that point you needed a big coil. So, so there's that, but I mean, this was kind of a blunt instrument. It's like you just see a big flash everywhere in your visual field, which I suppose if it's 1895 or 1896 or 1755 for that matter, that was pretty neat. But we'd like to make pixels, not just you know, blind you. So uh, my PhD student, Dan Novi, for his doctoral dissertation, created a unique array of coils so that we can make a steerable phosphine in your visual field. And then we did a user study uh, in a clinical setting just because we wanted to make sure everything was cool. Um, and by the way, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is what this is called, it is an FDA approved medical treatment when they zap other parts of your brain for various reasons. Uh, and so there are safety regulations about how high a magnetic field you're allowed to create outside the brain that's generally recognized as safe. And we're operating significantly below that amount. So this is not gonna zap you, um, and, but we still did the testing in a clinical setting. And so we ran 20 subjects through, and it works. And you know the pixels are kind of the size of a ping pong ball in your visual field right now. So it's sort of low resolution, but it does indeed work. And a later phase of this is going to try to uh, get the get the focus a lot smaller. If any of you studied physics or electrical engineering, you know the, uh, the culprit here is the fact that you may remember that Maxwell's equations for magnetic fields aren't exactly the same as Maxwell's equations for electrical fields. And so you can't focus a magnetic field in the same way at a distance that you could focus an electrical field. And so that's why the pixels are kind of big right now. Uh, but this is, you know, this is the far off future, is we'll just send the data right to your brain, uh, which 
you know, I'd still rather just build it into the physical world, but we want to be the people who got here first. And so we were. Uh, so that's the end of the slideshow. There's a whole lot of other work that goes on in my research group, uh, but I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions or comments. So thank you very much for your attention. Think back here. Chris, can you talk a little bit about the, the new thing you're doing, Magic Mirror? Well, what I can say is that, um, yeah, it is a, it is among other things a virtual try-on technology. So it is possible to make a very, very accurate three-dimensional polygon, rig polygon mesh of a human body, you know, in a very short period of time, say like a flash photo. Uh, and it is possible to drape somebody in a virtual garment that is indistinguishable from a physical one uh, and have it move realistically. And so the goal is can we show how you are going to look in a particular piece of clothing in the correct size for the shape of your body? You know, so you go to the website or you go into the store, but imagine going to the website, you go to the website and all of the illustrations on the website are you, wearing the appropriate size of each of the things and presumably ranked in order of the things that are most likely to good, look good on you given the quality of fit, you know, to the ones that are just not gonna look very good, but we'll show them to you. And then you can similarly create an immersive in-store experience, which might involve just a very large 2D display or it might involve a very large light field display uh, so that you can see yourself full size you know, if the imagery is that good. And so we have people who are doing a whole range of things, but they are you know, people who have some expertise in fashion as well as some expertise in user experience and some expertise in things like CGI or physics. And so we have the development team in New York and then we have some other people in London And if you know anybody who's interested in investing in the future of luxury fashion, please have them come talk to me. Yes. Um, I have a question about the last thing you talked about. Uh, the last thing. You, sorry. Oh, wait. Okay. It's all. Uh, okay, I was just talking. Right, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I have a question about the last thing you talked about, like the magnetic shell and put, not put information to your brain. Like before you did the experiment, did you have any idea what the users would see? Or like, it's just like, they'll see something, but you have no idea what they'll see. Well, so it's, I mean, there are people who have taken commercial transcranial magnetic stimulators and, you know, they're normally used in a different part of the brain and just move them around to the back of the head and have fired them and you see a, you know, a blob. Um, and so we knew more or less what we were looking for. Now, in our case, we were trying to make something where we could steer it and we were trying to make it as small as possible. And the question was, what were the thresholds at which people would actually see something reliably? And so you have to design a user study for something like that in an interesting way. So I don't know if any of you has ever had a visual field test, which is the test if you're older and they're testing to see your peripheral vision is still any good. And so in that test, they have random spots of light of varying intensity and varying position all over your entire visual field. And when you see one, you're supposed to press a button. And the trick is, it's not just do you have, do you correctly press the button when the flashes are there, but also do you not press the button when there are no flashes? You have, you have to have no false negatives as well as no false positives, or at least very few in order to really pass the test. And so we had to do something similar. You know, we had, because uh, we had to, you know, <laughs> have things happening and detect whether or not people were reliably seeing them. And if they were, were they seeing them in the part of the visual field that we thought we were putting them in? Because the area of the visual cortex we're working with, that's the last part of the neural wiring of your brain that is still what's called retinotopically mapped. In other words, it's still sort of a raster that corresponds to your uh, retinal layout. Beyond that, it's all shuffled in various ways. So it's really hard to predict where something's gonna show up in your visual field if you hit that but the, the area at the back of your skull is still mapped in a way that if we put a, a magnetic field at some location, we can know where it's supposed to be in your visual field. 
So the additional trick behind all of this is that in our system, there's a big capacitor and the capacitor discharges into the coil and it's impossible to not make it make a little bit of a pop. And so you know when we've discharged it. So we actually had to set up the experiment so the system would make the same pop without actually sending the current to the coil so that we could look for false positives. Like are you just hitting the button when you hear the pop? We can figure that out by statistically analyzing all the button presses you did. Uh, so you know that's a situation where it's not just you build the technology and you write the software. You actually have to think a bit about the perceptual experience and how you figure out is somebody actually seeing what what we want them to see. Did you ask? Did you ask these subjects to try to, try to describe describe in words what they were seeing, or was it only the button push? No. In fact, we have, and I don't think I have the slides <laughs> here, but we have we had people say exactly what they saw. You know, and a lot of people thought it was a little bit purplish, and one person insisted it was the shape of the state of Texas. <laughs> so they were very descriptive as to, you know, it's not perfectly round. It looks kind of like Texas, but it's a little descriptive, purple. Descriptive, but not the same. Huh? What's that? Descriptive, but not necessarily the same. So they were not always reporting exactly the same thing, but the fact is, it's hard to describe the phenomenon, because it's just a flash of light in your visual field. I mean, even if somebody just does that with a flashlight, and if you do that to 10 people and you ask them what they saw, they won't tell you they saw the exact same thing. Uh, so this is still, to some extent, a blunt instrument, and we're trying to refine it to something where you could imagine actually having something like dot matrix text uh, in your visual field using this technology. It's not quite there yet, but it's certainly conceivable that it can be. You've shown us a lot of really interesting final results, and I'm wondering if you could give us an example of the process from your concept to the result that you showed us. Uh, I'll quote Brian Eno, a series of barely controlled accidents. But uh, no, it's, you know, in some cases we have a pretty clear picture of what we want to do, and it's just a matter, I mean, like in the case of the safari, we sort of storyboarded it. and. We said, OK, we just have to build this out. And then we had people just start using it. And we got some feedback from them. And we tweaked it a bit you know, in order to, uh, you know, to make it be what we really wanted it to be. I think in some other cases, somebody would just start trying stuff and see what happened. And, you know, and certainly in the case of the volumetric cinema, there is no literature on what we're trying to do. And, you know, so we end up generating lots of stuff and then bringing in people who don't know anything about the project and asking them to tell us what's happening you know, in the scene down there so we can figure out do they get the visual language or do we have to improve the visual language or do we have to make it you know, slower or more self-explanatory or something like that. And so in that case, it's, it really is when we had a meeting yesterday morning where we just sat around and essentially articulated a whole bunch of 3D scenes that we needed to render in order to answer questions. Like, if a character walks off stage, what happens? You know, because it's a clipping box. I mean, so they can't, I mean, they just kind of disappear when they put one foot beyond the edge of the clipping box. People don't like that. So you said, well, how do you get that character off stage, uh, you know, in a way that isn't weird? Um, fades don't look the same in a volumetric display as they look in a 2D image. They look strange because stuff just gets less dense. Uh, you know, so it gets more ethereal, which is a cool effect, but it's not how stuff looks in a movie when there's a fade. Um, and there are some other things you can do that we've discovered that work very well. You can do a transition by doing a morph. Uh, I mean, literally, you know, you can have a person and then you can have a tiger, and the transition between the one scene and the other is you do a really fast morph from the person to the tiger, and people get that, uh, even though it sounds strange. So, you know, so we're just making a catalog of cinematic language for volumetric displays right now, and in that case, you just try stuff and have lots of people look at it and, and tell you whether or not it makes any sense, whatever. Sometimes the stuff that is just weird, you catalog that too, because sometimes you want stuff that's just weird. 
Uh, so we'll, you know, we'll probably use those at some point as well in the project. Uh, I mean, in the case of some of the work in 3D displays, there's just an enormous amount of trial and error. I mean, you can do all kinds of math, but ultimately you just have to have people try it and tell you whether or not it's bright enough, tell you whether or not they see 3D, tell you when it, you know, after I make one more step this way, the image starts to fade. You know, is that acceptable or do you need a wider field of view? Uh, you know, for some of these gestural interfaces or the haptic interfaces, again, you know, we had a general sense of what we wanted to do, but ultimately, you know, we built a version. We had people use it. We learned what we could learn from that instantiation, and then we would iterate the design to try to address what didn't work well. That's really how we ended up doing free space haptics, because we were doing a bunch of stuff with light field displays with a gestural interface. I mean, we had this molecular model that would hang out over a table, and you could grab one end of it and rotate it and pull it toward you and zoom it and so forth. And people loved it until they put their hand through it. And they said, well, I don't know whether or not I'm holding on to it. You know, it's, it's, oh, it's moving. I guess I must be holding on to it. But it's very unsatisfying, and it completely destroys, you know, your relationship with the object. But if you put your hand and it pushes back even a little bit and then starts moving, then you believe it's a 3D object. And figuring out, you know, exactly how much of that stimulus you want and, uh, you know, and how to apply it and what it should feel like, you know, that's really best done by trial and error. But then you develop a collection of best practices. Question in the back? Actually, yes. Uh, with the uh, haptics, how much realism did you find or how much detail did you find you had to put in there for people to actually believe that they were, say, flipping a lever or pushing the brain? Well, so, you know, there were two schools of thought, and ultra-haptics has very, very dense arrays of ultrasonic emitters, and they can address points in space very, very finely, and so they have a weak stimulus that's very accurate. And if you don't know it's there, you can put your hand right through it and not even know there was a haptic interface. So that's the trade-off. In our case, we have a very strong stimulus that we can focus very well, but it has limited degrees of freedom in terms of what the thing can feel like. I mean, mostly you just feel that it's pushing back on you. But if it looks really good in 3D, and if your hand goes there and it starts pushing back on you, your brain may be OK with the fact that you can't feel whether it's rough or smooth, uh, because that's not primarily what you're trying to do. You're not trying to feel the surface of the object. I and mean, if you need an application where you're trying to feel the surface of the object, you need a different technology than this one. But if you're using it, the use case that we talk about a lot is there are some vehicles like BMWs where they have a display where instead of actually having a touch screen, they have a hover interface over the screen. And so you can select things by doing gesture over the screen rather than touching it. The problem is there's no muscle memory associated with that. So you have to look away from the road and look at the screen and say, I want the third button. What if when you pass your hand across that field, you could feel three bumps, you know, and you say, oh, well, the third one's the defroster, and you just press the third one, you know, and it pushes back harder when you push on it. And so we've built stuff like that. And, you know, it's not super realistic, but it really works uh, because, you know, you're not even necessarily looking at it at that point. You're just trying to say, okay, you know, where's that thing? Oh, it's here. Press or pull or whatever. And uh, so, you know, the I, optimal technology for, for that kind of haptics that's universally applicable doesn't really exist yet. But I think we're, we're all learning, all of us in that space are learning a little bit about what works and what doesn't. And what works really well is if there is a coincidence between the auditory feedback, the physical feedback, and the visual feedback. I mean, if they all do the right thing at, together at the right time, your mind is very forgiving. Anything else? Oh. Oh, I'm just, just, that just brings up, is there anybody who's working with voice interface in a similar way there? Like, the, you know, like when you have a very large environment, the idea, you know, doing vocal interface probably will be problematic, but I'm just curious. Well, there's a really old project, an iconic one. I mean, this is a Kai classic um, called Put That There. And was Chris Schmantz's master's thesis in around 1980. 
uh, and it was a big screen at the end of a room and tracked your finger and it had a connected speech interface and you can imagine how hard all this was to do in 1980, but you'd have a screen with a whole bunch of stuff and you could point at something and you could say, put that there and the system knew what you were referring to and just did it and you could move things around and so forth. They didn't have haptics, but that's regarded as even now the gold standard of that kind of uh, interaction model because there was enough intelligence behind it that it got references. And so it's the same thing you'd tell a person, you know, oh, I want that. Um, and so, you know, and so when you start combining <clears throat> gesture or haptics with voice, you know, those are the kinds of things that people expect to be able to do. And, you know, there is a, the large user interface, it does have the ability to use voice and gesture at the same time. Um, although most people seem to just like moving their fingers around. Um, if there are a whole bunch of items on the screen, because you spend a little bit of time thinking about, oh, I want the blue one, you know, and uh, you could have just grabbed the blue one in the amount of time it took for you to think about how to reference it by name. I was just going to ask about the the large um, display interface with the with the five fingers. How how many different um, sort of metaphors did you try before, or did he try before? Because I think that's really elegant and well, so much better than what I've seen before. <laughs> well, so he tried. I mean, he tried a whole lot of things, and he ended up, you know, sort of applying John Mida's laws of simplicity. You know, stripping away things and saying, well, what are the fewest things you can do? that give you a big universe of interactions. You know, because I don't know about you, but I've seen gestural interfaces where there were 17 gestures. Yeah. You know, and oh, they let you do absolutely everything with those 17 gestures, but nobody's going to remember them. And so if you have only a couple of things, you know, and that's one of the things that Apple did really well with the first iPhone, for example. There were only a couple of things that they recognized, but they let you accomplish a whole lot. And, you know, and this is a slightly richer language than what you can do on a typical multi-touch screen, but it is just five or six basic things. Uh, and they're pretty easy to remember. I mean, they map pretty naturally to what happens on the screen when you do them. Although the basic interface, you can add as many as you want. Um, so you could, for specialized applications, make unique uh, new gestures. Uh, so it's you know, it's a framework more than a language at this point. You know, it enables implementation of language. But we had to do one in order to prove that anybody would want to use the thing. Yes, sir. Back, uh, excuse me, in the early 90s, I worked um, with a project where we had what was called an air mouse. Mm -hmm. And the air mouse was an Austrian company. It, think of it as a laser pointer where you could point it at a TV screen and you could move it around and it actually would move the cursor on the mm -hmm. screen. The problem that I had with it, and many people had, was that it was like holding the end of a 20-foot pole. Because <laughs> if, you, if, you if you move it, your, your wrist just a little bit, the, the thing right. would go like this on the other end. Do you have that problem with any of these technologies? Well, so in that case, you'll notice that the hand maps to a pretty big area. Yeah. And so it's not quite the same problem. Now, there is a problem. I mean, what I don't like about that interface is the fact that Nobody really wants to hold her hand like this for an extended period of time. It's just not comfortable. Um, and so that's why in a lot of cases people have done things where there's a little pad that's attached to the top of the table or something because that's more comfortable to have your hand on a surface than to have it just hanging out in space. Uh, so you know exactly when you use this and when it's active and when it's not active and how long you have to hold your hand up to make things happen is a bit of finesse that we haven't completely solved for every possible application for this right now. Uh, but yes, we, we like many other people, um, you know, back in the 90s, we had a laser pointer and we just had a camera with a red filter pointed at the screen and we detected the centroid of the laser spot and you could click on things with the laser pointer. And yes, you know, it was kind of fun, especially one time when we had an auditorium and we gave like 50 people laser pointers and they could all point at the screen and, uh, and you know, it was sort of like this crowdsourced fun thing going on. Um, but nobody does that nowadays for very good reasons because it, it isn't really all that pleasant. Uh, we do have a visiting researcher who's working on a different 
problem of how do you point to something in 3D at a long distance? Like how do you not just point to a spot, but how do you point to a depth? And so one of the things we're trying, and it turns out people can learn to do this very easily, which I was skeptical about at first. If you point with two fingers, at what depth do they intersect? And you can learn that really quickly, which is weird, because uh, I didn't think you could. But it's like having two laser pointers. Um, and so you know, it's not super fine, but if you have, say, four layers of stuff, you can point to the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one really easily uh, without thinking about it. And I don't know if that has any utility, but we're building it out right now, and we're just going to let people try it and see what they think of it. But in that case, it's not holding up your arms. It's really just pointing two fingers toward the screen. Is that a problem in real life, too, if there's four things to, to point it to, people, for somebody to know where you're pointing? If I have four things in, in depth, and I say, I want that book. Right. In real life, it's a problem. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, that in some cases, we are not good at doing it in the physical world either. And so expecting us to be able to do it perfectly in the virtual world may be a bit of a stretch because it's not something that people have, have developed an innate ability to just do. But uh, you know, we, we do a lot of these things and we find out, well, nobody, just, nobody ever did that experiment. So let's just at least do it and maybe we'll get a short paper out of it or something. Um, and maybe we'll decide it's a really horrible idea, but it's, occasionally those are really good papers. I mean, when you explore something really well, and you prove that nobody should ever do this thing, and you can articulate why. I mean, I love it when, as a reviewer, I get one of those because, you say, oh, good, that's a whole bunch of stuff I don't have to do now. <laughs> you know, rather than somebody who does a, an okay job of something is probably with more development, this could be made usable. You know, and some student picks that up and says, I'm going to do that for my thesis. <laughs> I don't want you to do that for you. <laughs> Another question in the back there, I think. Yeah, sorry. It's okay, I don't need it. <laughs> so, again, this is like back from the early 90s. We were doing a lot of work with both gesture pointing but also with eye tracking uh -huh. to try to coincide the two for um, robotics, actually. I've not seen that since. Uh, has that all the eye tracking kind of died outside of anything other than looking where people are looking at ads these days? You know, eye tracking is not completely gone. Um, it's appearing in funny places. So it's appearing, for instance, in driver assist systems. So you know, if you're only allowed to take your hands off the steering wheel if it knows you're looking at the thing on the road you should be looking at, for example. Um, and if you take your hands off the steering wheel and you look away from the road, not even by moving your head, but just by moving your eyes for too long. You know, it's a grab the wheel now. Um, uh, so that's what the uh, Cadillac Super Cruise system does, for example. And, you know, there are some other applications of eye tracking that are very specialized where it's still around, but it is not the universal interface that some people thought it was going to be for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, you know, including the fact that it's kind of uncomfortable. I mean, if you, are, if, if you used that thing for a while, it probably gave you a migraine you know, or TMJ or something. Um, but for certain applications, you know, in conjunction with other things, it can be good, uh, particularly if your hands have to be doing something else at the time. You know, then it does give you an additional degree of freedom. And I saw this thing at CES two years ago. Maybe some of you have seen that. So even though we can't wiggle our ears, we still have the muscles to wiggle our ears. And as a consequence, you can make a pair of glasses that has a sensor in the, in the temples of the glasses that can detect the electrical signal if you're trying to move those muscles. And so somebody made a video game pointer where you could learn to move this pointer in 2D uh, by moving those muscles that don't move. They don't connect to your ears anymore in, in humans. Um, and I think somebody went to a whole lot of trouble to build that system. You know, and it is not at a video game shop near me uh, two years later. So uh, I think we probably won't see it. But, no, but there is an, an enormous amount of interesting information that can be 
uh, exposed and exploited for user interface that people don't usually think about. This was very fascinating. You were talking about the visual part of the brain, and I was just wondering if you guys have talked about or thought about using this to help people that have brain injuries, concussions, or Alzheimer's, or dementia with Lewy bodies, because that's a visual spatial um, dementia, so. Well, as I said, at this point, it's fairly coarse. Uh, so it has limited applicability in its current state. Uh, second, you know, there are a set of limitations. So your visual cortex only develops normally if you start with relatively good vision. You know, if, you, if you're born with no eyes, you're, you don't really have a visual cortex at the back of your brain. So some people are interested in getting signals into the visual cortex for people who have, say, suffered eye injuries or, uh, you know, but up until that point, they had good enough vision so that the neural circuits are all still there. Um, so that that does limit the kinds of people you can apply some of this technology to. Uh, but that said, no, there certainly is interest, not necessarily using the technology we're using, but using technologies other people have come up with for getting information into and out of the brain. Uh, and that is going to be a hot topic. And whether it ever becomes a mass market product or whether it becomes something that's just used in a therapeutic session or session or just used with individuals who have particular deficits such that they can't use other kinds of interfaces is not clear. But there's a great deal to be learned in that space. And it's not just the sensing modality or the actuation modality. It's also how do you, you know, if you're trying to read data out, how do you extract the signal from the noise so there's machine learning to be applied or if you're driving stuff into the brain how do you calibrate the system and there may be machine learning going in you know that calibrates exactly how it finds the right places to send the signals to uh, so it's a fun field it's much more fun than uh, you know the so I was at a conference of people who are doing wired brain implants um, and there's some, there's some really creepy stuff that's going on. And there was a paper about how if you want to make it minimally invasive, you know, you have to do the surgery either through your nose or your ear canal. And somebody had, you know, developed this whole surgical regime for putting in these brain implants through your ear canal. And it wasn't really what I went there to hear about. But, um, you know, but there is a lot of uh, a lot of interest in how do we get data into and out of the brain in a way that's not too heinous. So you talked a lot about um, visual, um, whatever. But what about audio in terms of three D and and you know being able to localize things and coordinating that with the video? Well, so. There were other people in our lab who do, do a whole lot of work with spatial audio, and so we haven't. I mean, we've done work with taking a sort of ad hoc microphone array, like take all the phones in the room and use their microphones to try to find where sounds are coming from in the room. You know, um, but you're talking about the driving, and we don't generally do that work because there are other people who concentrate on that. So when you're doing these films, these 3D films, you're not trying to do the sound as well? Well, we're using somebody else's stuff. <laughs> we don't have to invent it ourselves. There's a guy down the hall who does it. <laughs> OK, and uh, we'll have time for one more question. Who's feeling uh, questioning? Well, I'm told that my amazing colleague, Hiroshi Ishii, will be uh, addressing this group later this year, and I hope you'll all come and see Hiroshi's talk, because if you thought mine was out there, uh, you know, Hiroshi is amazing. He won, you know, a Lifetime Achievement Award at the CHI conference, and um, he has been pushing a particular vision of how we interface with the physical and the digital, uh, you know, that has been really compelling and has made lots of people's careers uh, just because he, they've been inspired by what he's done. And so you know, I, hope, I hope you all can make it to Hiroshi's talk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming out on a grizzly night. <laughs>